Chai Gurudev, Jai Masters. Yogananda, he once gave a talk called Maligning Malignant Moods. People have moods. It's a very yogic thing, these moods. They are a tremendous opportunity for spiritual growth. It's like everything else. Things are what they are. That's not the issue. The issue is what you do with them. So, first of all, what is a mood and what causes a mood? It's very, very simple once you understand what's going on. When the Shakti is flowing, which relatively it can be, sometimes a lot, you fall in love, you're having a wonderful time, you're excited, you win the lottery. Why does that make the Shakti flow? It doesn't make the Shakti flow. The Shakti is always flowing. It opens you so that it's free to rise. You'll realize someday it is always there, but you are closed. Like the sun's always there, but clouds will block it. The cloudy day does not stop the sun. The sun sits in the sky and shines. Nothing, nothing stops the Shakti flow. It's natural within every single human being. So it's trying to flow up, but you're closed. You have blockages of things from your past, present, thoughts that you stored, that you didn't let go of, and they block the Shakti. They're stored inside the energy channel. So when something happens that your ego likes, we discussed yesterday very deeply, ego, when something happens that your ego likes, which is relatively rare, but not totally rare, it opens. So think anybody else. If you like what's going on, it's not hard to like what's going on. It's as simple as that. If you don't like what's going on, it's very hard to like what's going on. Well, what is it that likes and dislikes? It's not you. You do not like or dislike. You are the consciousness, the awareness of being that is aware that a part of you likes or dislikes. Maybe you've noticed, okay? When something happens outside that hits the stuff in you in just the right way, at just the right angle, with just the right words, at just the right time, with just the right person, it opens. Why? Because it likes it. If you get a massage and you like the masseuse and you like the table and you like the incense that's being burned and you had a good day and you open up. You have a wonderful time. If you don't like the person, somebody just died and you're scheduled for the massage and you got yelled at because you weren't there on time, you're not really doing very well with the massage. It's more like, keep your hands off of me. Okay? So it is something you are doing. Your ego is doing. Your, your psyche is doing. Your psychological energy is either open or blocked. When it opens, and it can, the Shakti flows. Most people credit the outside person, place, or event, or thing for causing that energy to flow. You say things like, oh my God, I love you so much. No, if they stood in front of you and you felt disdain, you would not say, I love you. It's because you're feeling love. You project it onto the object that helped open you, and you say, I love you. How hard is it to stop loving somebody? What do they have to say or not say? In one second, that ego closes, doesn't it? And by the way, that's why you're so sensitive. They say that you only hurt the one you love. Why? Because when you're open, you're susceptible. You're sensitive. You've let energy in. You've let the ego open up and dare to open. You don't feel love when you're closed. But when you're open, you're exposed. And so all it takes is the slightest thing. And boy, <laughs> it closes, doesn't it? Really, really quickly. So when you're open, the Shakti flows, and you are in a good mood. You know, something's happening to you like. You're looking forward to something, et cetera, et cetera. Beautiful day out. The weather is just balmy, perfect. Things can open you, all right? But many more things can close you. Many more things can close you. The ratio is not even close to how many things can close you versus what actually opens you. Not to mention totally opens you. You've been totally closed. That's not hard at all, okay? But to be totally open, I told you, like, you turn the corner and the sun is setting and you're having a decent day anyways and it's just, oh, the colors are so gorgeous. And it blows your mind. What it really does is blow your ego. The conversation that was going on in your mind 
thou can't. It's too beautiful. You open too much. And then what happens? The Shakti comes flying in and you feel all this uplifting energy. I like people say to me, no, you don't understand. I felt like I was in the presence of God. You were. Because that's what's flowing inside of you. Ever been that open? Can nature do that? It doesn't take a person or the lottery. A painting can do it. Music does it a lot. Can you get lost in music? And then just come back and there's just all this joy and ecstasy. So you are capable of totally opening. But that's not your normal state. That's an extremely rare state. You're capable of opening a little bit because something's happened that you like, okay? But you are really capable of closing. The driver in front of you can make you close. I just keep stepping on his brakes. I don't know where his blinker is. The weather can make you close. Oh my God, so humid. It's so hot, I can't handle it. You can close by anything. It's, it's, oh, it's raining. My God, it rains right when I have to get out of my car. Okay? These are moods. I'm explaining to you moods. You were okay, now you're not. It's raining, so I'm going to close. That's what's happening. The rain is not making you close. Rain cannot make you close. The car in front of you can't make you close. What somebody says can't make you close. You make you close. You choose to close. Somebody else, the farmer, needs rain. It starts to rain. He opens. Oh, Mary, look, it's raining. And you're like, ah, oh, rain, I got to get out of the car. You do have these moods. You see what I'm calling moods now? I'm not talking these extreme things, you know, where you're weird. You change in a minute, in a flap of a second. You go from okay to not okay to really not okay. I love the story that they tell in The Untethered Soul. You're in love with somebody, a beautiful relationship, and he or she breaks up with you. Suddenly, a sudden breakup. You didn't know anything was wrong. And you're depressed. You're just, your heart closes. You're freaked out. You know what's going on. You don't want to go out. You don't talk to your friends. You don't answer the phone. You don't clean up. You haven't showered. You just lay in bed. No energy. No anything. You're closed. You say, I got no energy. Of course you have no energy. You're closed. The Shakti is the energy. When you're feeling that Shakti, you're being fed from inside. The energy's flowing. When you're closed, of course you have no energy. Of course you have to sleep all the time. Of course you don't want to do anything. You have no inspiration, no anything. That's because you're closed. Now what made you closed, that's a different issue. But the fact is, closed is closed. And then you're not going to have any energy. And if you sit there and think that I'll never, and you do, you think I'll never get out of this state. I love her so much. I love her so much. I'll never meet anybody else. And I'm just going to be unhappy for the rest of my life. I don't even bother to do anything. You're depressed. What's depression? A mood. It's a mood. It's because you're closed. How can I prove that scientifically? Phone rings. You're a man, I don't get stupid phone. You knock it off the table, leave me alone. And it's that girlfriend's voice or boyfriend's voice. You just hear, hello, Charlie? Charlie, pick up the phone. Uh, you bother to reach out and pick it up. Ready? Oh my God. I'm so sorry. I never realized how much I love you. What was wrong with me? I must have been in a bad mood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. That I, will you ever forgive me? I realize how much I love you. Can I come over? Can I come over? I really want to apologize properly and have some time with you. Right? How you doing? Got a little energy? You want to take a shower, clean up a little bit, and get dressed? And I want to know. How long it take? You opened. It caused you to open. You closed. You opened. No Shakti? Shakti. It's all spirituality. It's all yoga. Okay? You choose to open. You choose to close. But you're not conscious enough to notice. Do you understand that? I told you in the new book, a very beautiful line in the book, says, the moment in front of you is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the moment in front of you. The moment in front of you is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the moment. The rain is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the rain. You don't have to do that. The car in front of you, the red light that you have to stop at, the train that you have to stop at, then you're in a rush. They're not bothering you. You're choosing to bother yourself about the events unfolding in front of you. Always. Those are gentle examples. It's always that way. Somebody you love picks up and leaves you, all right? If you don't want to be bothered, don't be bothered. The event can't bother you. You bother yourself about the event. What if this lady's got this terrible marriage, but she's Catholic? They can't get divorced. And he's a schnook. I mean, 
terrible. And all of a sudden, the inevitable letter, note, sits on the night table. I'm leaving you. I will not come back. Give me a divorce. I'm leaving you. Well, that lady goes to next to say, boy, <laughs> I'm done with him. Right, can it happen? The moment in front of you is not bothering you. You're bothering yourself about the moment in front of you. Now, I understand that you don't have a choice. That ego is extremely strong. It has preferences, concepts, and views, and opinions. If things match your preferences, concepts, views, and opinions, the ego opens. If they don't, it either neutralizes or it closes. And most people are not centered or clear enough and not done enough work on themselves, which is why we're here, to have a say in the matter. You're not deciding to, you say, well, I couldn't help myself. Well, you the only went in there. But you have allowed the monster, excuse me, the ego, to become so powerful that if it doesn't like something, you're done. Your heart hurts, your mind goes crazy, all of that. That's because it's used to running things. It's used to being in charge. So a mood is the opening and closing of the heart and of the mind. And if they are open, you're in a good mood. Uh, sometimes a really good mood. If they're closed, you're in a bad mood. Sometimes a really bad mood. The whole spectrum is a question of the opening and closing of your heart and your mind. Well, what determines their heart or mind open and closes? It's not automatic. It's not genetic. In a sense, you do. But you didn't make the decision at that moment. Over the course of your life, you had experiences that made you feel good. An experience that made you feel bad. You clung to the good ones and repressed, suppressed, resisted the bad ones. If you touch them, they stay inside of you. That's something that's the essence of the teachings. If you touch it, you own it. So somebody says something to you and you weren't feeling good anyways and now you don't like what they said. 20 years later, you could not like that person. Somebody uses their name. Oh, I know that I met them once before. <laughs> it's hilarious. You can't handle the shifts in energies that happen naturally, naturally through life. So you either cling to them. I like this experiment. I want to happen again. I compare everything against it. All right? The dinner's not the same. Last time I came here, they served something else. I don't want to come here anymore. You're very funny. So psychology says you're the sum of your learned experiences. No, you are the consciousness that is aware that your psyche is the sum of your learned experiences. And it is the sum of your learned experiences. You did not decide what to like and what not to like. You did not decide who to like and who not to like. It got patterned over the course of your life. You like a redhead. I don't like redheads. I like a blonde. I like a tall person. I don't like a tall person. You just made all this stuff up based on a movie you watched, an experience you had, a book you read. It doesn't matter. The point is something came in from outside. It hit you a certain way. And if it hit you good, you want to keep it. If it hit you bad, you don't want to feel it. You don't want to experience it. So you either cling or resist. And you build those energies inside of you. They call some scars in yoga. They're patterns of energy that you did not let go of. A great being, like Ramakrishna, I told you. Ramakrishna was asked, does a great yoga, an enlightened master, ever feel anger? And they were shocked when he said yes. He said, but it's like riding on water. What difference does it make if you ride on water? Write something dirty, it doesn't matter. Write something nice, it doesn't matter. Write the name God, you won't see it. The world comes into a yogi. I think the Gita says that, right? The world comes into a yogi and leaves him as it found him, at peace, serene, content, as all the rivers of the earth flow into the ocean and leave it as it found it. It doesn't overstep its bounds, it doesn't flood, so the world flows into the yogi and passes right through. That's what Ramakrishna is talking about. It doesn't mean you don't feel something. It doesn't mean something doesn't happen. It means it makes it through without you touching it without the self, the consciousness, having to do anything about it. Okay, you said something, I felt an insult or a jealousy, and there it goes. Now I'm here now. Now I'm present in the moment because I didn't hold on to the past moment. That's what it means to be whole, to be complete. So basically we don't do that. We resist throughout the course of our life things we don't like. We resist them, they stay inside. How do you know to stay inside? I don't need to give you that lecture. You dream about them. You think about them. Do they come back up? Do they come back up? Okay, that's because you kept them inside. <laughs> the event doesn't come back up, but something hits your stuff and whole things from flying back up. Now, now you got more moods. 
Why? Because you close because of the things that made you close. Let me ask a question. Do you close because of things that made you close before? If something reminds you of something that closed you before, do you close? Well, no wonder you close so much. You stored everything that ever bothered you inside, and now anything that reminds you, somebody's voice sounds like somebody else's. You walk into the kitchen, and the smell is like what your mother used to cook. And you got along with your mother, you'd melt. You didn't like your mother very much, and what she cooked wasn't worth eating. And, and basically, you close. A smell. Now you understand moods. This is why they shift. This is why it goes up and down. This is why all that happens is because you stored this stuff in here. And so now the ego closes and opens almost automatically based upon the experience it's having and how it relates to what happened before. It very rarely, the sunset was an experience where you're being opened by what's actually happening. Otherwise, almost every bit of your thoughts, your heart, your experiences, your moods are based on what happened before. It just all stimulates it back up. Somebody can say one word and it reminds you. I, I can't believe you said that. My mother talked to me like that. And now you're understanding moods. That's what causes moods. Opening, closing. What opens and closes? Your heart and your mind because they're programmed based upon the stuff you stored in there that's still in there and it gets stimulated, doesn't it? It gets touched. And so basically... That's what's going on, and that's what's causing moods. That's what causes your moods. And then what happens is it builds on top of each other. The mood that got stimulated because somebody said something, somebody didn't say something, or something happened that reminded you of something that bothered you in the past, causes you to close. Now you're in a bad mood, which will cause you to close later. Another impression, like you were eating at a restaurant, and they served the food that made you close or something that reminds you of something, right? You're not going back to that restaurant. The thought of the restaurant makes you close. It multiplies. And so basically you will go up and down and up and down like a yo-yo. And what you'll try to do is say, well, I don't like to be down. I need to find somebody. I need to find something. I need to find a job that's passionate about. I need to be turned on. Somebody needs to turn me on. Why? Because you're turning yourself off. That's the only reason. If you were not turning yourself off, you'd be in ecstasy all the time. I'm serious. All the time. Master said there's a river of joy that flows up inside of you. There is. Except you're blocking it. And so now what a normal human being does is try to take the sum of their positive experiences and go on a vacation that will be most like that and meet somebody who reminds you of this, that, and the other thing. Something opens me. Like I said, you then say, I love you instead of, well... I told you what to say. No, don't do it. Don't listen to anything I'm saying, please. It doesn't work in this world, right? If you feel love, the proper thing to say is, oh my God, I feel so much love in your presence. That is a true statement. I feel so much love in your presence. You know what that does? It keeps you from thinking that if you ever lose them, you're dead. Why? Because you've admitted it's inside of you. It's wonderful to love. It's wonderful to share. But it's not wonderful to become dependent and sit there and, and start becoming possessive and clinging and jealous and all the stuff that goes along with that because what you said was, I love you, your love, not I am experiencing love in your presence. And if I'm not experiencing love in your presence, there's something wrong with me. And if I'm not experiencing love in everybody's presence, there's something wrong with me. You're going to understand, perfect your relationship with one person, then spread it to everybody. But you can't do that when you say there's only one person in this life that can open me. Well, what if they don't? Well, I'm depressed. I, I lost my soulmate. I always tell you, you do have a soulmate. You're it. You are your other half. You're the one who cuts yourself in half, saying things have to be this way for me to be okay, and if that way, I'm not. You did that. This is the part I think is hilarious. Your entire life, you screwed yourself up, haven't you? You got bothered, you stored this stuff, you got some scars all over the place, you go into moods up and down, and you just met somebody that you don't even know. You know for a month, two weeks. You've lived this for, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, okay? You honestly believe that that person is going to know how to keep you open. That's their job. But why else would I marry you? <laughs> I told you, I love you. 
Yeah, that means that you're supposed to make me feel love. You're supposed to know when I need this and know when I don't need that and know when I need my space and know when I need to be taken care of and et cetera, et cetera. And then don't lose your job because I, I, no, no, money had something to do with it. Right? And, and don't get old. Oh, <laughs> you were good looking before. Right? I, I got pictures of you all over the place and uh, not the new ones. What are you doing? How can you expect somebody else to overcome what you're doing inside yourself? You literally go as far as, I'm not worthy of love, I've never, I screw up every relationship I've ever had, right? Can you fix that? <laughs> but I feel love in your presence, like you must be that special person that neutralizes my whole lifetime of garbage, not to mention lifetimes, of garbage that I stored inside of me. That's what you think your relationship is. That's ridiculous. That's absurd. So I said, of course you have relationships. They're very good for your growth. But because you learn, it's happening inside of me. Love is inside of me. Shock is inside of me. Inspiration is inside of me. Passion is inside of me. It's all inside, isn't it? <laughs> when you feel it, it's all inside of you. Even the most intimate moments. Nobody has their eyes open during the most intimate moments. Why? Because they're being pulled inside with the beauty that's going on inside. You're just feeling, oh my God, it's beautiful. So it's inside of you. It's always inside of you. And it's not just yoga or some spiritual journey. It's inside of everybody, that's all. But if you close off, you're not going to feel it. So now you're out there, silly. I can't even believe I've been doing it so many years, I can't even talk about it. You are absurdly going out there trying to find things that will open you. Why don't you just stop closing? <laughs> Since you're doing it, you're closing yourself, you decided what to close about. All of this is you. You're doing you're the only one in there. It's just you. You experience your thought. You experience your good mood. You're ever in a bad mood? How do you know? Ever in a good mood? How do you know? Because you're in there. Is it the same you who notices the bad mood as it notices the good mood? That's a serious question. Is it the same you who notices that when you're in there, there's nice stuff going on, and when you're in there, there's uh, razor blades going on? Yes or no? Does it notice your heart opens and closes? Does it notice your mind some, uh, have a bad mind day? Or sometimes the mind gets really quiet and beautiful? Isn't the same being that notices both? There's only one of you in there. You're in charge. You're the boss. But you have let the reins just fly around. I used to use the example like, like getting up and going in the back seat and let the car drive itself. You wouldn't even think about that. That's what you've done with yourself. You let go of the reins from the very beginning and just said, if it makes me feel good, I'm, I like it. Make me feel bad. I don't want it. And I store it all inside of me. And now I'm a bundle of junk. I'm a walking target anything to happen and I'll close and most people don't know how to not close and don't know how to get out of being closed until they get so depressed that the mind who's closed what does the mind sound like when the heart's closed oh my god I don't feel good it's terrible it has no energy what does the mind sound like when the heart's open and shocks is flowing oh my god I could take on the world this is great this is the best day I've ever had in my entire life yes or no you didn't make it do that it's the shock that flows the energy comes up, the mind's positive because it's getting positive energy. Just like your body needs energy to be healthy. If you're closed, it doesn't get the energy and everything becomes dark and negative. Those are your moods. Maligning, malignant moods. So now that we've laid the groundwork, you do not have to live like that. You do not have to live with that. Do you know who the people that most don't know what they're talking about? are the ones who say you can't experience joy unless you're experiencing sorrow. You can't experience love unless you experience hate. That's so caught in duality, it's absurd. You are capable of transcending that entire human aspect of your being, transcending the ego, transcending all this junk that you stored in there, and having nothing but constant light pouring up inside of you. Constant. I am not exaggerating. You want to feel love? Wave your hand in front of your heart. When it passes that chakra, structure comes flying up inside. That's who you are. That's who every single one of you are. It will never go away. You're blocking it. That's why. If the sun is shining, but you look down all the time, do you see the sun? No. That's what's happening. You are looking down at your ego. You're looking down at your blockages. You're looking down at what's blocked inside of you. And developing your whole life based on that and then saying, I need things to be okay. You do not need anything to be okay. Not psychologically. Don't let them tell you that. You're whole and complete within yourself. You're the most beautiful thing ever walked the face of the earth. You're a great being. 
but you are looking in the wrong direction. You're looking down. Why? Because the ego is so strong that it distracts your consciousness down toward it, doesn't it? If your heart hurts, where does your consciousness go? Right there, doesn't it? If your mind is complaining, where does your consciousness go? Right there. If you feel need, where does your consciousness go? Right there. These things draw your consciousness down to them, and therefore you don't know that there's pure light pouring inside of you. It's just behind you. Someone might say, Yogananda, how can I be enlightened? I want to know God. Tell me, Master, how do I know God? He just turned around nonchalantly and said, He dwells right behind your every thought. Oh, my God. What dwells right behind your every thought? The consciousness that experienced the thought. Do you know you have thoughts? How do you know? Somebody notices. There. He dwells right behind your every thought. Whoa, that's pretty close, isn't it? Well, why don't I experience it? Because you're drawn into the thought. Your consciousness is distracted by the thought. Therefore, it doesn't hang out with the center that is experiencing it. It gets pulled into it. So that's the story and those are our moods and that's why it is the way it is and that's why life is so difficult and it is difficult. It's like Buddha said all life is suffering because that's a mess. It's just a mess. <laughs> okay? And you think and they teach you that's the funniest part of why I live out here in the woods. They teach you that the way to solve that is to get what you want. That's absurd. No, the way to solve that is to get rid of the blockages so that you're whole and complete every moment unconditionally well. Not to get what you want. So, to, Which of you have gotten what you want ever in your life? Yeah. Which of you was at the end of wanting things? What, are you kidding me? It will never stop. It has never stopped. You, you now have a you know, front row seat to watch a lot of rich people make a mess of their lives, don't you? Rich and powerful people. You think they're all okay? Happy all the time? It's all wonderful? Not a chance in the world. Has nothing to do with money. Has nothing to do with looks. Has nothing to do with, with relationships. Has nothing to do with people loving you. Has nothing to do with any of that. You think because you're really popular? Hey, rock stars are really popular. Why are they doing drugs? Why do they kill themselves? Wake up. The problem is not that you're not getting what you want. The problem is that you have an ego that wants things because it's blocked. The only reason you want things is because you're blocked. If you are not blocked, you feel joy welling up inside of you. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that leaveth the mouth of God. It's amazing. Christ was a yogi. Every single thing he said is absolute truth. Bread means the outside world. You don't live just off the stuff that's coming in from the outside world. There is this energy flowing inside. It is spirit, shakti, chi, call it whatever you want. There's another name off the same stuff, all right? That energy is coming from the divine. It's coming from your connection to the great energy. So you're living off every word to live in the mouth of God. Every single thing that's taught in deep spirituality is telling the same truth. It is not about getting what you want. <sighs> It's not. How often, if you get what you want, do you get tired of it? Here, there's a favorite food you like. You just love his favorite food. Tell me all about it. I'm going to get the best chef in the world that has ever made that dish for anybody, for kings and queens all over the place. I'm going to bring them here and have them cook dinner for you. Excited? Yeah? Excited weeks before, right? You get turned on. There's a thought of it, really. <laughs> oh, man, so far out. Okay? Is it there? Eat it? How is it? Perfect. I mean, perfect. The best chef ever existed. It melts in your mouth. It's exactly everything you ever... Th See, I'm not saying you get disappointed. You're not disappointed at all. You're like blown away. This is the best experience you ever had in your whole life. All right? So you say, okay, would you like to have it again tomorrow? Yeah, are you kidding me? Of course I would. What about the next day? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. How about for breakfast, lunch, dinner, every day? <laughs> Give me some Brussels sprouts. It's like, you want anything but that, don't you? There's no way that that keeps turning you on, is it? Okay? It's because it's new. It's because you haven't experienced it before. It's special. Go to the same hotel, to the same place, and do the same thing every time you go on vacation. But it was so good last time, it's not going to be the same next time. Is it? There's a law of diminishing returns. That's an economic law. Law of diminishing returns. What does that mean? The more you get something, the less utility it has to you. Why? Because you get used to it and it stops opening you. So basically, you can't win that way. The answer, since the problem is that you're closing, 
that you've collected all this stuff that you're closed about so they're like targets that things can hit and you become moody. The answer is not to s control the world to get what you want and avoid what you don't want. Seems like it's that, but it's not. The answer is to do some inner work and to sit there and say, if the cause of my not being high, of my not feeling excited, not being enthused and feeling love is because I close, I need to learn to stop closing. That's something I can do. Out there I can compete with everybody else. It's not easy to get what you want, is it? Inside, there's no competition. If you can solve the whole problem with no competition, it's just you and you, wow, I'll take that one, right? If you learn not to close, you will be open. If you're open, that shakti will always flow unconditionally. So now the question becomes, how to not close? That is the entire spiritual journey. Are you capable of not closing? Yes. Are you capable of not closing over anything? Eh, not right now. Okay, let's be honest. Not right now. Are you capable of learning to not close? Well, you learn calculus. You learn how to ride a bicycle. You learn how to drive a car. You learn how to play tennis. You learn how to play the flute. Do you learn things, yes or no? Did you know how to do them before you learned? Are you sure? I told you my favorite saying is, you walk into a college calculus class, Calc 101, you sit down, everybody's in there, you sit down, get the energy together, and the professor walks in and says, okay, welcome, this is Calculus 101. You raise your hand, oh, excuse me, professor, I'm in the wrong room, wrong class. Why? I don't know any calculus. That's like you telling me I don't know how not to close. I wouldn't know how to do it. Well, that's right. I agree. I admit it. I agree. But there's a thing called learning. And it's the most important thing you will ever learn in your entire life. Why? It will solve every problem you ever had in your entire life. And you will never have another problem. If you never close, you will never have another problem. Problems are things that close you, aren't they? How come she gets turned on by you get turned off by? Because she opens, you close. Based on what? Past experiences. So basically, if you learn to not close, that is worth learning. That's more important than anything else you can ever learn. Then that's what spiritual growth is about, not closing. How do you learn not to close? I go into it very deeply in Living Untethered. You don't start with the big things. You have to play tennis, go play Borg or the Williams Sisters. You'll never play tennis again for the rest of your life. If you never play the piano, sit down and take on Tchaikovsky or Mozart for your first piece. <laughs> right? You know, it's a chance you'll never play again. That's what you're doing with this, and that's why you can't grow spiritually. He's in there saying, well, so-and-so died, and I, I have so much trouble, I, I don't want to meditate anymore, it didn't work. That's all you care about, is the ones you have trouble with, you're trying to be okay during those. Otherwise, I'm okay, I have moods, yeah, sure, I have moods. No, your moods matter. That's where you do your work. So I talk about to start with, now let's talk about how to stay open. You know how to stay open? Don't close. If you don't close, you'll be open. You don't know how to be open, but you do how to not close. You do feel yourself starting to close, don't you? You feel it. Your energy starts getting like that. Right? And the trouble is you get into it. Then you close. All right. So what you do is you start with what I call the low-hanging fruit. You've all heard this, but it's, you better hear it over and over again because you don't do it. I want you to start with stuff that's so simple that you're embarrassed that you can't do it. Okay? It's raining out, or at least it's drizzling. Can you handle that? Can you handle it? Well, good. Then do. All right? It's raining. It's thunder. It's hot. Can you handle that it's hot without closing? Can you handle that it's raining without closing? Can you handle that you're getting every traffic light on the way into town? Every single one is turning red when you pull up to it. Can you handle that? Why do I call it low-hanging fruit? Because you can't do anything about those. It's not like, oh, I should have done this. Or, no, there's nothing you can do about it. So why are you bothering yourself about it? Learn to let go. That's called letting go. People say, I don't know what you mean by letting go. Yes, you do. You just don't want to do it. Okay? You start to close because your ego doesn't like these events. And so the next thing you know, you're complaining. Next thing you know, you're feeling off-center. You can work with that. You work with that. How? Relax. The first thing you do is relax. Anything else you do until you relax, you're trying to make it stop. If you're trying to make it stop, 
I don't like the way the driver in front of me is driving. He's driving 10 miles below the speed limit. Oh, my God. If you're pushing that away, it's not going to go away. It has to be like Ramakrishna. You're admitting, yes, I see that it's bothering me. Let it go. Letting go doesn't mean push it away. Letting go means letting it go. Let it be riding on water. He wants to complain, let him complain. Just let go. Let it go up. Relax. Don't resist. Staying open is non-resistance. Letting go is non-resistance. You know what resistance is? Anybody ever resist anything in there? You have hands in there. They can push things away, yes or no. You know what I'm talking about. You have will. That's will. You can push it away. I don't like this. Push it away. Right? Relax those hands. I dare you. Relax them when they're ready to go push away. Oh, it's hard. Of course it is, because your ego doesn't like the experience, and it wants you to protect yourself from it. You do not want to protect yourself from that which is not hurting you. You don't want to protect yourself from that which you're causing to hurt you. <laughs> there's nothing happening with a race. There's nothing happening with the driver in front of you. There's nothing happening with all these different things, lots and millions of different things every day. The only reason they're bothering you is you decided they did. You decided, I don't like this. That's why it's bothering you. If you decided you liked it, it wouldn't bother you. That's how you tell it's low-hanging fruit, that the only reason it's bothering you is you decided it will. I don't like what she said. But she said, I don't know, but I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like her body language. <laughs> Help! <laughs> 95 to 99% of the time, what you don't like about another person is because you're projecting what you would be thinking if you had said that or if you sat like that. And you just realize you're projecting yourself onto everybody and then not liking things. And so you just decide, okay, I'm going to wake up in the morning. This is your sadhana. I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'm going to remind myself I'm not going to close today. Or at least I'm not going to close about the little things. Don't make it too high. You don't try to play Beethoven when you're first starting. Play your scales. It's okay. I'm telling you, you can just play the scales. You can do it. You'll make a mistake sometimes. But play the scales. Play the scales of staying open. There are going to be times that happen during your day that it gets hit. Stuff gets hit. Are you willing to try and let it go? Just try your best. But what if I can't? Then you didn't. I don't care. What if I hit the tennis ball and goes into the net? I don't want to play anymore. No, no, no. It's okay to go into the net because you learn something. You learn how to hold your wrist. You learn how to swing your arm. It's good that it did. It's okay that you fell down. It's okay that you didn't handle it. It's okay that you got into a mood. As long as you are doing your best throughout the day to recenter and play with it and sit there and say, I'm not going to close over these stupid little things. But you think it doesn't matter. I'm telling you, it does matter. If you ever played an instrument, you have to practice. It's not a waste of time. It's not meaningless. You will never get good at an instrument unless you practice, will you? You will never get good at not closing unless you practice. So these things are meaningful, but nobody tells you that. They're too busy with the big, how to handle when somebody dies, how to handle when your favorite boyfriend leaves you or goes out with somebody, your best friend. <laughs> I don't need you to worry about that. They don't happen that often. And you'll never be able to handle it if you can't handle the small stuff. So if you will work with the low-hanging fruit sincerely and honestly, don't just listen to this as words. This is your spiritual growth. Well, well that's easy. Good. Let it be easy. I want it to be easy. You will get better at this. And therefore, you won't cause yourself so much trouble. You won't cause other people so much trouble. You hear me? Because you're not fighting and struggling and getting mad. So basically, you work with yourself. There are lots of ways to do this. But I'm telling you, don't make it sound like this is not worth doing. This is your spiritual path. If you can't do this, you can't do the other. If you can't play the scales, you're not going to play Beethoven. If you can't handle the rain, you're not going to handle hurricanes and things that happen. So basically, you practice doing this. And you'll get better at it. And you'll find out that slightly bigger things you're able to handle because you practice. God, I, it's so stupid. I feel stupid talking about it. Why well, I have to sell this to you? If you practice tennis, you're going to get better. All right? If you practice letting go, you're going to get better. It matters. It's very important. And then you do it in the morning. You remind yourself that that's the meaning of my life. That's the purpose of this day is to practice letting go. That's why you're here. Earth is a place that souls are sent to evolve. You're not sent here because you're perfect. 
Earth is a place that souls are sent to evolve. This is how you evolve. You practice. You practice. And then at night, you sit down. Okay? You meditate. Take your time. But take a moment for this. And you see, did I let go? Or was there something I didn't let go of? And you take a breath and say, do I want to keep this with me all night and let it ingrain itself into my ego and let it be just another thing that's going to bother me tomorrow? Is it worth it? Because of the way the driver drove or because somebody didn't say something. And you say, no, I didn't let go during the day. I'm going to let go now. And it hurts. It hurts. There's a reason you resisted it. It hits your stuff. Let go. Every morning, commit. Every evening, renew the commitment. Let go. If you will do that, you will grow every single day. You have to, because you didn't take out more junk. But what about all the stuff I have in there already? Don't worry about it. Don't even think about it. Don't worry about it. But sometimes it gets hit. That's okay. Do the best you can. But do this. Do the ones that you're capable of doing, but dare to do them, and then you'll see you can do more. Naturally, no blame, no guilt. If what happens, if I if I lose it, and I, I get into an argument with somebody, and so on. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. Just before you walked in to talk to him, center, do the best you can, and then when you leave, the moment you get your consciousness back, let go. But I, no, there's no but. Don't judge yourself. Don't judge them. Nothing. Just let go. Just another way to let go. Another time to let go. And you can't do anything about it anyways. It's over. And then what will happen? You'll start getting good at it. And then you're going to find out that the stuff from the past, uh-oh, full disclosure, all right, starts coming up by itself. Nothing has to hit it. Nothing. You're just driving your car, doing your thing, and you start crying. The stuff starts coming up. You remember what mother did, and this happened, or that happened. You become more sensitive. Why? If you shove stuff on top of it, it can't come up. Now that you're not putting more on top of it, it's more open to come up. Well, I thought I was doing well, and I think I'm doing terrible. No, you're doing wonderful. You want it to come up. It's blocking the flow of your shakti. And what will happen when you let go of little stuff, you start having nicer days. People write me all the time. I, just, I thought I was doing great. But now, <laughs> it's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to grow. You're supposed to have bigger and bigger stuff come up so that you can practice letting it go. Well, what do I do with it? I told you, the measure of low-hanging fruit is if it wasn't bothering you, there's nothing to do about it. You can't do anything about the car in front of you. You can't do anything about the weather. The biggest low-hanging fruit you think is the biggest hanging fruit. What? Your past. Why? You can't do anything about it. Can you? No one has ever changed the past. It takes a time machine. There's not a single thing you can do about things that bothered you in the past. The only thing you can do is make them bother you now, which is pretty stupid. If it happened in the past and it's not happening anymore, I don't know why you'd want to keep bringing it forward, every single thing ever bothered you, and let it bother you for the rest of your life. You know, my example, go to a restaurant, Eat something. It didn't sit well. It just, I don't know. Something, ugh, something's wrong with it, right? Well, by all means, ask for a doggy bag every time. Take it home. It's a special room in your house. It's called the bad food room, okay? <laughs> and go in there every morning. Take a little taste. Why would I do that? To remember how bad it was. You do that with every bad experience you ever had. Don't you? You keep it inside of you and keep remembering it and bringing it back up and let it bother you again. But it happened to you when your psychology tells you when you're five years old, things happen. You're 55, they're still bothering you. No, I haven't talked to my mother in 50 years. <laughs> oh, that's great. You hear me? Because you kept it inside of you. So I call that the ultimate low-hanging fruit. You don't, and psychology doesn't. Why? Because you stored it in there for so long, you can't even handle the thought of it coming back up. But it's blocking your shakti. You're letting this stupid stuff that's not even happening block the most beautiful part of your being. And you have to avoid things. You, know, right? you can't go home. You can't do this. can't talk to this person. Blah, 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 blah. There are songs you can't listen to. You know that? All right? Sometimes you say, this is our song. Well, then that was the song you broke up on. I guarantee you don't hear that song anymore. Okay. That's how you want. You have to have all these soft spots around that you have to avoid for no reason. They're not happening anymore. Devote yourself to purification. That's purification. Devote yourself to saying, okay, I'm going to start with the simple stuff. In other words, I'm not going to put any more in there. It's bad enough I got this stuff in here. Then that stuff's going to start coming up. Good. But it hurts. Of course it does. No pain, no gain. If it's stored with pain, it's coming back with pain. All right. So we're having an honest talk here. This is your life. 
So the old stuff, you want it up. Someday, you will let go enough, and that shakti will start flowing. You're going to sit there and say, oh my God, that's something very beautiful in here. And then, then you reach the next part of your spiritual journey. That first part is realizing you don't need to have this junk and moves and all this crap going on inside of you. It's because you stored the blockages that you don't feel alive. So you work on letting go of the blockages. If enough shakti starts coming up, enough energy starts coming up, you like it. Of course you like it. And you realize, wait a minute, there's an indirect proportional relationship between the blockages and the amount of shakti that's flowing. I want these things out of here. Now nah, you're that's a spiritual journey. Not I want to get what I want. Not I want to get what my ego wants so it doesn't have to be bothered so I can feel good. No. I want to let go of the blockages. That's the devotion of my life. Things come my way that turn me on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Things come and turn me off. Thank God. Let's learn how to let go. I don't want anything to turn me off. And you start feeling enough energy inside that it gives you the strength to say, bring it on. Bring it on. Ramakrishna used to say, helter skelter, come with me. Just bring it on. I don't want any, you know the saying, you want a piece of me? Right? And you say, yeah, here. You take it. <laughs> I don't want it. That piece of me that you hit, uh, that's nothing but a problem for me. Here. Right? And the next thing you're giving away your junk. You're just giving it away. Just let it come up. Give it away. Let it come up. But how do I know what to let go of? It will let you know. You don't have to find it. You don't have to go searching. You don't have to do anything. It will let you know it's time for it to come up. It will come up by itself. Just don't push it back down and don't complain about it. Oh, my God. I thought I was done with my ex-husband and I really, he's still in there. Oh, I hate him. No, it's not going to come up that way. You have to learn to love your stuff. You have to learn to love your ex-husband who treated you terribly. It was a terrible divorce to sit there and say, boy, you were some serious growth. <laughs> You put me some through good stuff, man. I mean, look how hard they train for the Olympics, right? You put me through that kind of training, man. You're, you're, you're quite the coach, all right? I'm so glad that I met you. I'm so glad we had this, this tumultuous relationship because it, it taught me how to let go. And now I honor you. I respect it. I, I'm letting go, right? Yoga Shakti, the saint that gave us the Durga statue, she used to sit up here very quiet. In the 70s, she started coming. She said, Problems are the nectar of life. If you got everything the way you wanted it, you would not grow. You would never change. You would stay right where you were. You don't want that. You're here to grow. And so the challenges and your stuff coming up, learn to welcome it. Now, first you can, but do the easy stuff first. But I'm telling you, eventually, you will welcome it. You will just sit there and feel this energy coming up and say, hey, I ain't never going to close again. This is, this is beautiful. And the people around you benefit because you're shedding light. And you realize, no, no, I don't have this ego. You start looking at your ego. You're just a blockage. You're one big blockage. What I like and what I don't like and who I like and who I don't like and what I want and what I don't want. Give me a break. You didn't make my life conditional. I don't want my life to be conditional. I want unconditional love, unconditional peace, unconditional well-being, unconditional enthusiasm every minute of every day. You're capable of that. And so you learn to let go. And as you let go more, it pulls you up more. And as it pulls you up more, it gives you the strength to let go more. And eventually, you are a letting go machine. What did you do today? Let go. <laughs> That's what I did today. I let go. Did you go to work? Yeah, I let go of work. Did you come home with the family? I let go of the family. Did you take care of the kids? Yeah, I let go with the stuff they were bringing off. Okay? And you just kind of honor every moment of every second of your life because it's helping you grow. And then I'm just going to close. I always close in the same place because you need to know this. That's not high. That state, that's a nice state. That's a high human. But you're not human. At some point, it comes up enough to where it's not like I have to let go so it stops because you've let go enough to where it's nothing's drawing you down. And you start realizing, what is this energy? It was so beautiful, I got lost in it, but where's it come from? Shakti is beautiful. Where is it coming from? And you start getting more interested in the flow of the Shakti than you were ever interested in your ego. And then the ego falls off. If you don't pay attention to it, it just starts to fall off. But well, then you get pulled up even more. There's nothing pulling you down. And eventually it feels like this vacuum cleaner is pulling you up all the time. And you realize, I can't let go. It's like it's almost like it's calling me to let go of it, but but I'd have to die. Be like Christ said, you have to die to be reborn. And you start realizing exactly what that means. That you have to let go of yourself as a sense of individual consciousness. The drop 
falls into the ocean. As the Mayor Baba said, my drop of consciousness that used to stare at me fell into the ocean, find it. You can't find a drop of water when you drop it in the ocean. It's what we call merge, union. The word yoga means union, merger. That's where the great ones went. That's what an enlightened being is. That's what a sat guru is. If you're talking about my father and I are one, that is your state. But that's way up there, all right? But that's kind of nice to know there's no end to your growth. There's no end to your growth. It's higher and higher and higher and higher. More and more beautiful. And the more beautiful you become, the more beautiful the world around you becomes. Even with all of its problems. You understand that? Like the world where Christ lived had just as many problems as we have now, just different. The world where Buddha lived, same thing. But they kind of made a difference, didn't they? Right. No more moods. Maligning, malignant moods. Do you have moods? Now you know what they are. And you know that they're spiritual because they show you where your blockages are. They show you where you didn't let go enough. All right. Work on these things. Jagrath.